Sometimes people just pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. But there's little traction or no answers. If I were to ask you, what is prayer? What would you say? Many people would have, there'd be a lot of different types of responses. What is the priority of prayer? Does God answer every prayer? The most important key when it comes to praying isn't you talking. Some people's prayer life is just their request list or their needs list. Lord, I got this issue going on in my life and I need you to fix it right now. I think a lot of us pray about things that we're supposed to be doing. We ask God to do things that we should be doing. And that's our prayer list. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with requesting. Scripture says you have not because you ask not. But more important than what you say is what you hear. Most people just pray hoping God hears them. But God has promised that his ear is not heavy, nor is his arm shortened. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear, nor is his arm shortened that he cannot answer. Some people spend hours in prayer. They pride themselves in praying for hours. There's nothing wrong with praying for hours. There are times when I pray for long periods of time. Jesus even told the disciples, could you not just pray one hour? But it's not about just praying for hours and hours and hours and getting no results, seeing no answers, receiving no solutions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says... But as it is written, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Some may say the deep things. Notice he says that God has prepared. Not that God is preparing. Prepared doesn't mean that he's got to do something. Prepared means he's already done something. He's already prepared it. When you pray, it's not like God has to go necessarily do something to get something ready because everything that you need in your life has already been prepared for you. Oftentimes we're praying, asking God to make something when he's already made something. So it's not so much about you convincing God to do something for you. Is it, about, is, it is about you hearing what God has done for you. As you're living life from day to day, countering things that you didn't expect or see coming. But that you hear God say, here's what you need to do. Here's the answer. Here's the solution. He gives that to us. He says he has prepared. He has prepared it for those that love him. That's a key. But by his spirit, he reveals them to us. What does he reveal to us? He reveals what he has prepared for us, to us, by his spirit. A carnal Christian will never get this. A fleshly Christian will never get this. If you're more aware of your flesh than you are the spirit, 
you won't get this. But he says, by his spirit, he will reveal. So when we pray, it's more about spending time listening. Because that's real prayer. Real prayer isn't about you just having a one-way conversation. I'm going to rush into my prayer time, and I'm going to tell every God, tell God everything I'm thinking, and I'm going to rush out about my day, and I'm going to look back at God as I leave and say, now make sure you take care of all that. Versus going before God. And it's okay to lift up some of the challenges or problems or frustrations that you're facing. But more than saying, God, here's what I need you to do. You need to spend time allowing God to speak to you to show you what he's already prepared for you as it relates to what you're facing. There's a story in Luke chapter 18. It's a parable. But a parable is God revealing something about uh, a spiritual truth that is, it's, it's, it's a real truth, right? It's a natural way. But he starts out in this parable by saying, men always ought to pray. Now, when he says men ought to, ought to, they ought to always pray, he doesn't mean that you go around just constantly praying in tongues. Or just walking around, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. When he said men ought to always pray, it's, it's not talking so much about what you're saying as it is about your communion. It's about learning to walk in intimacy with him. It's being aware of his presence, him being with you, present with you. There is a level of prayer that goes beyond words. There is a level that you can go to in your relationship with him where you're just constantly in communion with him in the spirit. You're aware of his presence. And as you face and encounter things, you already begin to pick up. There have been times in my family's life where we're doing things, right? We're going somewhere doing something. And my presence has helped to navigate certain situations. In the moment, on my feet, I was able to make a judgment call, call something, and as a result of that, navigate through situations. When you're walking with him in this level of intimacy, It's the same situation that you don't have to say, wait a minute, I got to run over here and pray. He is with you and he'll help navigate you. He'll give you what he's already prepared in advance. So in this parable, this, there was a certain judge that didn't fear God. Now he's teaching something right here. He's teaching how this guy got prayer answered, but this isn't the way it necessarily needs to be answered. He said there was this judge who did not fear God, reverence God, respect God, nor did he regard men. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because of this because this widow troubles me. So he's teaching that your prayers can trouble God. So he, so he goes on to say, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Because she won't leave me alone. Least her continual coming, she weary me. And the Lord said, hear that the unjust judge, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night to him? Shall God not respond in a greater way 
for his elect. If the unjust judge will respond to this woman because of her persistence in her causing weariness with her much words, will God not do greater for you? God not avenge his own elect day and night, though he bears long with them. Notice he says he bears long with them. You don't have to do it this way and it take a long time. Now, if God heard your prayers the first time, why did someone have to wait a long time for God to answer those prayers? He says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find real faith on the earth? Now, I want to show you this in real life example. In Acts chapter 10, there was a man by the name of Cornelius who was an unbeliever. And God moved for this unbeliever. It says in verse 1, it says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household. So he had a respect for God, but he wasn't born again. It says, who gave alms generously to the people? And he prayed to God always. Somebody say, he prayed Always. In about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision and an angel of God coming to him, saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before me. Now send men to Joppa and send, send them for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel spoke to him and departments and a devout soldier among, among those who are waiting on him continually. So when he explained all of these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So here is Cornelius praying always. He's praying like Jesus taught that this woman was praying in the parable. To the unjust judge. Constant, persistent, prayed always. When there is specific prayer in specific places, over a period of time, it creates portals, it creates openings. That's why it's so important. To have a church, to have a place that you pray. When Jesus was saying you need to have a prayer closet, he was saying you need to have a specific place. It's not that God doesn't hear prayers any place that you are because he will. And he does. But when there has been an opening in the spiritual realm... There is a flow that is different than if you pray in any place. I can stand in Walmart and pray and God hear me. But when I stand in this place and pray, there's no opposition in the spirit because of the prayers that have been play, prayed in this place. So Cornelius had prayed over and over and over again, and he had created this opening in the heavens. And because of his continual prayer in this place, it was a place that released angelic encounters. 
I've told you this, that angels aren't with you everywhere. They're not with everyone. They don't go with everyone everywhere. Angels are attracted to right environments. Angels are attracted to attitudes. Angels are assigned to assist us to do one thing and one thing only. And that's to do the will of our Heavenly Father. Angels only respond to the will of God. It's always measured through the context and the lens of Scripture. So in this place, Cornelius was praying, and the angel shows up. We have gotten so used to reading about angels in the Bible that we think that's the only place they can exist is in the pages of a Bible. Angels are in this place right here today. Sometimes I'm aware of an angel's presence. Sometimes in my heart, I just know there is one present. There was a service that we had a long time ago, and Christy said there are angels that are literally flooding down the aisles of the auditorium and filling the stage. Because of this man's continual prayer and his giving, now you mix giving with praying, it does something different in the spirit. It says that his prayers and his giving, well, actually it says his giving first. So he gave first and prayed second. Most people pray first and give second. They pray about, is that really you, God? Should I really do that? Cornelius gave first and prayed second. It says his giving and his prayers went up before God as a memorial. You go to certain national parks and you may see some type of monument, a memorial to remind you of something. When you go there, you see these monuments. They they stand out. They're designed to get your attention to remind you of something. His giving and his prayers went up before God as a memorial. That means they stood out above everything else that is happening in heaven. His prayers actually rose higher than everybody else's prayers that were rising. I've been to different parts where there were massive memorials, whether it was in London or Washington, D.C., or, or in the South, certain parks, there are big memorials. And sometimes you see a lot of people in these places. And everyone is relatively about the same stature at these places. But a memorial stands out head and shoulders above everyone that's standing there, observing and watching. You go to the Statue of Liberty, people look this small. But the statue can be seen from so far away. Our prayers rise before God But there are some times that they can become a memorial before God. Meaning that when God looks, he sees them standing out above every other prayer. And as a result of his prayers coming before God, God sent the angel to his house. Now this man wasn't even saved. Your praying and your giving can change everything about your home. It can change everything about the trajectory of your entire family. It can change everything about your children. 
It can change the course that they go in, in life. It can break family curses. It can break bloodline curses. Can change your life, will change your life. It'll change everybody that's connected to you. Cornelius' prayers and his giving, it literally opened up the door for the gospel to go outside of the Jews and so that the Gentiles, the unbelievers, could, could be born again. This is the first place it happened. So the angel shows up and gives him this divine instruction. Notice, his prayers led to him receiving instruction. It's supposed to take you into a place where you can hear God giving you specific instruction. You need to know something. And the times that we're living in, there are going to be many, many times you need to know something. And you can't turn on the news to find out what you need to know. You need to know something that comes straight from heaven. And God gives him through this angel. This angel shows up so they have a conversation. And the angel tells him what he needs to do. You need to go to Joppa. There's, there's a man by the name of Peter. He's on Simon the, Simon the Tanner's roof. And God, at the same time, at the same time as dealing with Peter, and he catches Peter up into a trance. A trance is an open vision. It's where when you're awake, You see something in the spirit realm. And he sees this blanket coming down with all of these animals on it that are unclean. And Peter begins to reject what he's seeing in the spirit. And God says, don't call anything unclean that I've called clean told him to rise and eat. He was giving him specific instruction. He said, there's men coming. When you really tap in to this place that I'm describing in the spirit, you will receive instructions on a dimension that the carnal-minded Christian will never receive. They are good people, good loving people, but they will live their life off of pop-up devotionals And they'll live their life praying little bitty, two-minute, three-minute prayers, lifting it up before God, hoping that God hears them going year after year after year, seeing little to no answers because they've not yet learned how to die to their flesh, how to get their soul empty of all of this worldliness and tap into the Spirit so you can hear what God is saying in response to what you're encountering. And so Peter receives these instructions. There are men coming, and you're to go with them. And immediately he came out of the trance, and at the same time there were men that had been sent from from Cornelius' house to Joppa to get Peter. They had never met Peter. They were following the angel's instructions. They show up at this place, knocking on the door, and Peter goes with them. Peter comes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius' house is filled with his family members, with his friends. Cornelius describes to Peter what happened with the angel. Peter describes to Cornelius what happens, happened to him with the trance. And Peter stands with a house filled with people that are Gentiles, unbelievers. And he speaks, he shares the gospel, and everyone in that house gets saved, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and it said, and they all began to speak with tongues. These are keys. This is how you get your loved ones saved. I know you've heard me talk about Jacob when he went to Bethel and he laid his head on the rock. 
and he woke up because he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw an open heaven. He saw a ladder ascending from, a ladder going from the earth into heaven. And he saw angels that were ascending and descending. They weren't descending and ascending. They were ascending and descending. Angels were already there. Angels didn't show up because he was there. Angels were already there. Now let me explain to you why angels were already there. Because in that moment, he received specific instructions. God ministered to Jacob. When he woke up, he said, this place is awesome. This is none other than the house of God. Now, what you may not know is that if you trace back through Scripture, that Abraham had gone there to pray. Abraham had built an altar there. Abraham had worshipped and prayed at Bethel. Abraham had done something long enough that he opened up a portal in a place called Bethel. That's why praying in every place isn't the same as praying in some places. And, and Jacob's wandering along life and he comes to Bethel and he grabs a rock and he lays his head down in a place that he did not realize was an open heaven. Because Deuteronomy 28 describes brass heavens. Heavens that can be closed. Heaven is not open over every place in America because of the sins that have been occurring in America. But it's possible for you to live a blessed life in a cursed world. You can navigate through the curse with an open heaven when you can stand right next to somebody, the heavens are closed over, but they're open over you. So in this place, Abraham had built an altar and he had worshipped God. And it was a place that there was an open portal because he labored. When Solomon built the temple on the day of dedication, the priest had prayed and they had labored there. And the prayer that Solomon prayed was that God, if your people get taken captive, may they be able to turn toward this place and pray and have an encounter with you. That's why when Daniel prayed three times a day, he would open up the windows and he would pray facing Jerusalem, the place where Solomon's temple was. He was praying in that direction because he realized praying in every place isn't the same as playing, praying in some places. So when Solomon said, Lord, let this monument, let this temple remind people that when they see it, they can face it and they can pray. And their prayers can come into this place and ascend before you from this place. And so Daniel prayed three times a day with his face turned toward Solomon's temple. And God heard his prayers. Even in the midst of opposition and extreme persecution, heard his prayers. In Habakkuk chapter 2, the prophet said in verse 1, he said, I'm going to climb up to the top of a tower and I'm going to stand and I'm going to watch and I'm going to see what he has to say. What God has to say. The tower is a place of prayer. It's not literally meaning go build a tower. It's meaning you have a consecrated place that is elevated in the spirit above every other place. It's a sacred place. It could be in a park. It could be under a tree. It could be in your car. It could be in your closet. Most certainly, it's in this place. 
You see some of these people running around with prayer team shirts on. Their prayer life's not limited to this altar. There's a room that most of you don't even know exists. It's where the coals placed on the fire. And there's people in that room interceding and praying before every gathering, sometimes during every gathering. They're interceding, they're praying. But they're not just praying what they want to happen. They step into the Spirit. That's why in Romans chapter 8, it talks about the Spirit makes intercession. It, it's not us telling God what we want. It's, it's God through us praying what He desires, what He has prepared, what His outcome He intends for it to be. So you get to this place in the Spirit where you begin to tap in to the Holy Spirit. And rather than you communicating to God, it's the Holy Spirit through you beginning to labor. It's Him through you beginning to release what He's already prepared. Are you getting what I'm talking about? Is this making sense to you? I prayed, I prayed the other day, and I asked God, what do I need to teach about to, today? God said, go ask your daughter. He did. He told me, go ask your daughter. She didn't know I was going to preach this today. I asked her, I said, what would you like to hear preach, preached about, taught about? She said, I want to hear about intercession. I want to hear about prayer. I walked away. And this is what God gave me. By the way, she's here today. There she is, coming in right there. She's been at discipleship training school for two years. She just graduated. She's going back next year for the school of ministry. And to go to school of ministry, it is, for, it is only for people that are giving their life to full-time ministry. She's going to live her whole life serving God in ministry. But the psalmist, oh, it's not psalmist, Habakkuk, the prophet in Habakkuk chapter 2. He said, I'm going to go to this high place, this tower. And I'm going to stand and I'm going to look to see. It's a place of prayer. But in that place of prayer, he was more interested in seeing and hearing what God had to say than it was me going to God and telling him what I have to say. And then in verse 2, he says, write the vision and make it plain. What you see God say. When God responded to him, he said, now write it down. Make it plain. When you hear me speak because you prayed, because you have this consecrated place that you go to over and over and over again, it is a place where I will meet you. It is a place where my voice is easily heard. Some people are like, I pray all the time, but I can't ever hear God. That doesn't line up with Scripture. The Bible says you're His sheep and you shall know His voice. It shouldn't be, oh, the pastor hears from God. Wish I could hear from God like that. I had a pastor... Call me the other day, reach out to me rather the other day. And he's like, I want to learn how to operate in the spirit the way you are with words of knowledge. He said, will you teach me? So I gave him some instructions. Two weeks later, 
He replied back. He's like, I'm blown away. He said, I heard God. I took a step of faith. And God moved and touched somebody's life. That's why I don't just let anything go on in this place. You know this ground, and we live in a culture where we have gone so many years helping people to understand that we are the temple. That we have so minimized the importance of this sacredness of this gathering and this house. That it's caused people to walk away with this thought, I don't need this house. I can do this anywhere, but you can't do this anywhere. This ground is holy, it's consecrated, it's sanctified, it's prayed in. We have labored, the heavens have been opened, principalities and powers have been pushed back. That's why it's so easy to worship. That's why it's so easy to pray. That's why it's so easy to flow in the Spirit. That's why it's so easy for miracles to happen. Because the heaven is open over this place. But you can't take an open heaven for granted. Because what opened it is what's required to keep it open. In Deuteronomy... When they begin to get into disobedience, the open heaven turned to brass. And it said it was shut up over their head. And the earth became dust under their feet. Meaning it was a place of spiritual dryness. In a place when the world has gone dry, there's still a flow that comes from heaven. And the level of God's river is rising. And your spirit can continually be refreshed. I want you to stand. Everybody lift your hands. Everybody say, Lord Jesus. I want to hear you. I want you to speak to me. I want you to minister to me. Holy Spirit, I'm open to whatever you have, to whatever you want to do. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, Minister. Now just listen. Pray that God would give you the ability to hear. Pray that God would give you the ability to hear. Yes, yes, God. Yes. Pray that God lift Holy your voice. Spirit, yes, God, God. Church, lift your voice. Yes, God. A man of God said this one time. That God is more eager to answer than we are to ask. God wants to speak. God wants to minister. God wants to lead you. God wants you to ask. Father, I pray right now that whatever has your people on mute, I pray right now that that mute button would be removed yes. in Jesus' Come name. Come on, pray that prayer. I pray, God, right pray now, that prayer in the for name yourself. of Jesus, that, these, that your people would open up their mouth in Jesus' name. Your word says that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. How do we expect to be saved if we don't call on the name? We can't expect God to move when we don't call on his name. Call on the name of Jesus, church. Lift up the name of Jesus. Yes, God. Pray and ask Jesus to move in your life today. We call upon your name right now, God. Father, I pray, let there be an inspiration that takes place. Let there be a challenge that takes place. God, let your people not be offended. This is for them to rise up. This is for them, go God, to accept the challenge, not to be crushed, God, or put down, but for them to rise up and fight. 
like the people of God that they are, like the soldiers that you're calling them to be, God. Father, remind them, God, God, that the voice, God, that you are voice activated, that you yes. move. God, when you hear your people pray in Jesus' name, no matter what wall stands before you right now, I pray right now that your people will speak to it, yell at it like in the days of Nehemiah. Oh, God, in Jesus' name. Oh, Rosa Rabba Baba Shora. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Rosa Rabba Baba Baba Esa raba ba shenda la masete yese rebe rosa raba ba sheta raba. Yes, people call on his name, call on his name. Mora sata raba ba sore rosa raba sheta. Ora sata raba ba sheta. Ora sata raba she. God has so much prepared for us, people. Another man said this: Prayer prepares you for what God has prepared for you. Prayer prepares you for what God has prepared for you. There's a storeroom in heaven, and God desires to pour it out. But when we don't pray, we're not ready to receive it. We're not prepared to receive I what receive. God has prepared for us. God has things prepared for us. We heard Pastor Jay preach about it. They're already prepared. But when we don't pray, we're not prepared to receive that which God has I prepared receive. for us. Receive. What Come on, God shout out, receive. I receive. Come on, shout out, receive. Come on, I lift up your voice and say you receive. I receive. I receive. Give God a great praise right Jesus, now. Jesus, Jesus, yes, God. Oh, Come on, put your hands together. Give God, God a great praise. Yes, God. Yes, God. Jesus. Somebody yes, shout God. hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. The greatest miracle, greatest miracle is people getting right with Jesus. Like the gentleman just did a moment ago on the telephone. There are people in this room, you're not ready to meet Jesus. You're not. You're not ready to stand before him. There are people that have never been saved in this room. There are people that have drifted away. You've gone back into habitual sin. And God in His grace and in His love is inviting you to come to Him, to be right with Him. He's calling you. When I count to three, I want every hand raised that's not right with God. I'm going to pray with you today. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't put it off. On the count of three, lift it up. One, two, three. Raise your hand. You need to be right with Jesus. Raise your hand. Thank you, sir. Keep it up. Come on, raise your hands. I want every raised hand. I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to come here right now. I want to pray with you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. As, uh, as these people are coming, check my hand. <laughs> as these people are coming, I want you to ask the person beside you, do you need to go? If they say yes, say, come on, I'll go with you. Ask them right now. So good, so good, so good. Anybody else do you need to come? There's nothing more important than this. This is the most important thing. So glad you're here. Why are you crying, your children? so happy your boys are giving their life to Jesus. So good. You know, there's nothing more important than this. And lose your soul in light of eternity. 
I wouldn't give anything for salvation. Life here is but for a vapor. Eternity is forever. Jesus has given us salvation as a free gift. It's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. There's nothing you could do to earn it. There's nothing you could do to somehow perform well enough. It's simply God saying, I want to save you. I want to forgive you. I want to come into your life. And I want to invite you to walk with me throughout the rest of your life. And the only way for you to receive what's being given to you is what? Reach out there and take it. Take it. That's how you do it. All of us together, we're going to pray. Everyone pray out loud with these men, with these ladies. Everyone say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I give you everything. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for forgiving me. I'm yours in Jesus' name. Amen.